Okay, let's get started. Welcome. And, uh, and we're very happy to have a Professor Ad uh, Gainan here. Uh, Ad is a professor at the Department of Astrophysics and Planetary Science of Villanova University. Uh, he received his PhD in astronomy from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, when working on his thesis, uh, he and two uh, Villanova colleagues discovered the ring of the Neptune. And uh, then uh, uh, after that, he has held uh, numerous uh, academic positions, including uh, uh, the James, uh, James Cook uh, University um, visiting professor or adjunct professor in Australia and a visiting scientist at, at uh, Harvard Smithsonian and uh, uh, associate director of uh, Biruni Observatory of Shiraz University in Iran, where he helped build uh, Iran's first high-powered telescope. Uh, he has been guest investigator in many NASA and NSF uh, facilities and missions, including Kepler. And uh, his research interests include uh, solar and stellar dynamos and magnetic uh, evolution, binary star systems, uh, pulsating stars, red dwarfs, uh, stars, which we'll discuss more today. Matt? Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I threw a little bit of uh, solar stars in this, so in the beginning. So living with a red dwarf is about whether uh, uh, these hundreds of millions of very common stars can uh, can host planets that have that have life. This is a follow up to a program that we started a long time ago uh, called the Sun in Time, 1990, where we uh, studied the solar type stars from young to old, and in terms of uh, their magnetic activities. And so I'll do a little bit of this. This is what I add it because I am at a solar institution. So, and then living with a red dwarf and all about red dwarfs, more than you need, you, all you need to know and more, uh, and then results, some results on uh, some of the things that are going on in this living with a red dwarf program. Uh, some examples are uh, old red dwarfs, captain star, and then some uh, 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 applications, because you can get ages from the red dwarfs from their rotations, and then con conclusions in future. So uh, sun and time, it's a terrible clock because it always stays at three. But <laughs> I'm using that to time the talk. I'll just zip through these because you, I've talked about most of this. So there's the sun and time process. You have the, uh, these are actually drawings, but they're made up to be the approximately right uh, spot sizes, spot areas. So this is young. Uh, these are the X-ray emissions. This is rotation, just what I was talking about. And then you have the present sun in, in here somewhere. So this is their rotation periods approximately. And this is their uh, X-ray uh, luminosities and ages. And I kind of made this up to make it look like how the star could look. This is what I'm just talking about then. This is just an example. Um, this is rotation period versus age and has a very nice rel relationship. Some of these are, are averages from clusters, like Pleiades are down here. And here's the sun and Alpha Centauri, and working with Travis from a Kepler, not from, yeah, from a Kepler emission from asteroid size seismology, uh, the rotation periods of these two older stars were uh, determined. Uh, I'll get back to that in just a second. This is an example of one of the plots. This is LX, this is coronal uh, luminosity versus age. And you see, again, a pretty good relationship. This is, it's hard to get ages out here because even star evolution codes are not accurate. So this has an astro seismic age, the plus or minus 0 0.3, 0 0.4 giga years. So these are just the upper, upper limits, but these will be observed. The interesting thing here, maybe for the group in this office, is that the sun was always higher by about two times than these two stars here that were very close in age. But since 2001 or two, the sun has dropped down uh, since uh, about 2002, since the last cycle, to be more normal. That is, to fit in with other stars of its same age. This is probably because this, the, all, the previous X-ray measurements were all done during the grand maximum of the sun, and the sun has come down to what is more typical for a star of its age and size. This is a little interesting here. When we started to see scatter in this area, I broke it down into, we thought that 16 sig A and B would have up here, the previous was would be at 28 to 30 days, but it looks like mass matters here. Is that the stars of solar mass spin down at a faster rate because they're lower in mass, of course, and the higher mass stars like Alpha Centauri, 21 days, 
And these guys, which are in the area of 21, 22 days, spin down slower. So it looks like there's a, a, a break starting to occur here when you get more data. It's showing that this, there's a little width here, uh, depending upon what the mass of the star is. And actually, this is we ran this through a model, and this is kind of what you should get. The, the line here is the average. So in breaking it down into sub subgroups, the result of our early work this time is this figure. So this is uh, age versus uh, irradiance. And these are the, the hard X, soft X, and all that. And it's all normalized to the present sun. So the present sun sits here. This is the luminosity of the sun, uh, which is increasing about 6%, 4% per billion years. So the sun used to be 70% its present luminosity. And it's continuing to go up. And if you go out here further, it just jumps up. So this was the data that was used. Uh, and these are actually these points here are specific stars for which we had ages and which we had all the parameters. These are back in the days when we had EUV covered, uh, had FUSE covered. We don't have these satellites today. So this is the time when we could ask for time for specific stars of known ages to fill in these areas that you can't get today which is the uh, extreme uh, ultraviolet. This is what Jeff was talking about. So the irradiance of the solar stars are known very well from birth to present and even older. This is, but you need winds when you do, want to do modeling. So this is not so certain. So this is a plot from Brian Wood, and Jeff, Jeff has one too, which is mass loss, the M dot kind of. This is relative to the present sun. And you see an increase here, kind of what you expect. But then when you get into fairly active stars, they drop down. And whether this is real or not, and what, what will happen when you have better data, does, does it go up to 1,000, or is this correct? It, it's explicable uh, way of explaining. This is, this is a fairly young star. That star is 300, 300 so a million years old, pi one. Maybe it's the viewing angle. There's just not enough data over there to, uh, and I hope you. I might add that. There's only one instrument up there yes. that can do Hubble. these kind of measures. Well, it's the STIS instrument on Hubble, yes, yes. high resolution mode. And who knows how long that instrument will right. be operating. It's important work, and I hope this gets done. And there's no replacement. No, ever. It won't be done again. Screen. So uh, we really need to do this. This is a plug for One of the things I love to like, get see, the Jeff, Jeff, Jeff paid me to, to come here today. Give more time. Yes, that's what, give them more, more, more time. OK, uh, so that's, that's the summary. Uh, far ultraviolet was very, in the young sun. This is a sun at 100 million years old. Uh, the x-rays were higher. Visible light was fainter, so it was a dimmer sun. It had lots of flares, more energetic than today, because we, we sat on a solar type star for 30 days and watched it flare, sometimes like uh, well, two to five major ones. So it did a flare. There may have been mass loss. If you, if you believe, if you extend that mass loss up to uh, to out to a young sun, you can get up to 500 to 1,000 times. If that's the case, I have a real range in here. There's enough mass loss that the, the original sun would have been 2% more massive, and therefore about 10% 10, uh, 10 more luminous, which takes away the so-called dim sun paradox. But without that solar, that young, the data from the young sun, you can't say. Uh, this is maybe. Maybe we lost this. Yeah, we did. That was a movie. <laughs> she got lost in the shuffle, uh, showing a coronal mass ejection. So what happens is uh, with, uh, you have a, if you have planets located close to the star, that means like within the Earth's orbit of a solar type, type star, and un unprotected by magnetic fields, the, the young sun, if it has winds of 50 to 100 times, kind of ablates them. It wipes out the, uh, evaporates away the uh, atmosphere. And this is how it works. So this is done. Also, it's done with collaborators who I met at co conferences and who I shared data with. And so this person, this is Griesmeier's thesis. So this is the this is the winds of a weaker. So the star is over over here, and this is a magnetic field. So stronger winds uh, depress slightly. They depress the uh, magnetic field of the planet. But if you have a young star, like that one I just showed you half a million, half a billion years old, the winds are so strong that it, it compresses this in to the point where on Venus it actually went to the surface. And that's when it lost its atmosphere very rapidly. So if the winds are very strong, 
it, this protection zone, the magnetosphere of the, of the planet, is uh, within 10 kilometers of the surface. And that just means you have a runaway. Uh, you have the gas just spewing off. And that, that can happen around red dwarfs, too. In fact, it does happen. And this is the process. It's called ion pickup, which I think somebody already mentioned. Was it you, Travis? Oh, yeah. Ion pickup, you have a combination of the ultraviolet and x-rays, which ionize. And you have the plasma coming out that picks up the ions and carries them off into space. So it's called ion pickup mechanisms. And again, that's described briefly there. There's an experiment going on now at Mars, which is actually studying this, uh, MAVEN, which I'll show you briefly. So these are the results. This is Mercury. I already told you about Mercury. And this is Venus. And Venus lost its water quickly. Uh, this is the thing I was talking about. This is a plot of how dense they are versus um, what's versus. This is their mean de density versus diameter. Mercury just stands out uh, with the rest of the terrestrial planets. And so this is the comparison to size. Mercury's a smaller planet. This is now scaled. Now you see the iron core uh, coming almost three quarters of the way out. So an experiment was carried out. We uh, took the data from the young sun and with different values of winds and, and bombarded the uh, uh, planet, bigger planet, it was the size of the Earth. And it took about half billion to a billion years, and it got down to about the size it is today, with the mantle being about three quarters of the way out. Again, this is, this is a controversial, because you could also have this happen by a collision process where Mercury was hit by something rather large, like the Earth was. So this is one of the three ways of explaining uh, why Mercury is uh, strange. Yeah? So if that planet is tightly locked, does that mean that you can introduce some kind of asphericity in the planet? By well, was it, it may have, might have been tidally locked in the first half well, billion. I mean, in, yeah. in general, yeah. for another exoplanet. Yes. And exoplanets, yes. Uh -huh. yeah, we didn't know what to do. We, we didn't have it tidally locked because it was, um, this process was, the sun dies down very rapidly in terms of its x-rays and UV radiation. So we took the first billion, uh, half billion years, and the job was done. The process is actually still continuing. Mercury is continuing to lose surface, but at a very, 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 very slow rate. And this is the messenger data uh, showing uh, an image of, uh, this is uh, Mercury, one of the flybys. This go down to here. So this is, the, this is material being blowing off the planet. So you see the sun's in this, this, this direction. And uh, so this is the second and third flyby. The sun was actually active during this time. So you can see material. It's very, very tiny. This has been super enhanced to show up. So the amount is minuscule. It's not losing much mass at all. But the process is still taking place by the same mechanism. So they see sodium, potassium, things like that are being blown off the surface by the combination of x-rays and ultraviolet. Especially if there's a CME, you can get pretty good uh, tails on that planet. That's our, that's our atmosphere water loss on early, Merc early Venus, which I won't show. Just, it's there. It's, it's a 78-page paper. <laughs> uh, it was in Russian. My contribution to the paper was I gave them the data and I corrected the English. <laughs> so, and that was more than a lot of people. Correcting the English was months. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't take any credit for the modeling we gave them. The, this is a, a quick on, uh, we worked, first collaborator was Helmut Lammer from Austria. So, and Tom did this. It's, uh, lo, it's um, well, he was going to be here. I'll just erase his name. He shouldn't be. Forget Tom. He's on a beach in Miami right now. <laughs> but uh, it was a study of, uh, of doing the same thing to Mars. So Mars, this is the story of Mars. Mars, up to three and a half billion years ago, had a magnetic field. You can test it. There's still remnants of that field around, although it's, uh, it no longer has any, doesn't have a dipolar field. So this is kind of a, I just took Earth out of here and stuck a picture of Mars in there. So this is Mars when it was happy. A liquid core, um, uh, magnetic fields, happy planet, maybe even life, oceans, uh, 100 meters thick in some places. Uh, but then the sun. The sun was acting on it, but it was protected. But then it, uh, it cooled down, and then it opened it up to 
weaker solar radiation, because the sun, this is a billion years after the sun was a baby, so it's weaker, but enough, and Mars is further away, one and a half times the Earth is. So it was weaker, but enough to actually start to dissociate the water, drive off the oxygens, the hydrogens, I mean, but leaving behind the heavier uh, oxygens in the model. And that's coming out to be close to the truth. So this is the, this is the numbers that, there were various wind numbers that we used, because we didn't know what to put in for wind. Uh, for the wind for the early sun. So MAVEN is at Mars today. Uh, well, for, not today, it's been there for half, half a year. And it is actually measuring the uh, water dissociation taking place on the upper atmosphere of Mars. So even though the sun is very weak compared to what it was in its past, aren't, aren't we all? Uh, the sun was a robust youth and had all this uh, 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 energy. Uh, it, it still is doing a, a, a number and actually getting rid of Mars. It's actually happening with the Earth, too. The Earth is losing water. So this, this, this uh, instrument is measuring that. Bottom line, then, is this. And I'll use this for, this, for the magnetic, for the uh, red stars, the red dwarfs, because the same thing's going to happen. Is that in our solar system, the most important thing you need here is a strong magnetic field and magnetosphere. That's the lesson to be learned. If you don't have that, uh, you're not, you lose your atmosphere, probably not, the planet will lose its water in inventory, and, and it makes life very uh, hard to develop. So when the sun was young, the sun did a, had all these things going on, x-ray, UV, uh, strong flares, probably CME events, although none, we have not detected a CME event, we were talking about ways of doing that, but probably it did, because they kind of scale with flare rates. And that's why we're here and why there aren't Martians and people or things on Venus. Okay, the Red Dwarf program. So this is, uh, we call this Living with a Red Dwarf. I stole it from Living with a Star, Living with the Sun. Uh, this is our original logo. Uh, <laughs> didn't go over well. We had a big NASA thing up here and uh, they, didn't, they didn't appreciate it. So we switched back to the other logo. So this is, <laughs> That was, that was an April Fool's joke. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is the basics of red dwarf stars. They're called DM, DM, or they're called M Roman numeral five, or red dwarf, if you're friendly with them. And they are low mass, 0. 0.6 to, they're just barely stars, 0. 0.07 is no longer a star. So they have low masses. Their effective temperatures are cool. Their luminosities are tiny, actually lower than that number, 0, 0, 1, 0, three zeros and a 1 to about 5% the sun. Their lifetimes are enormous. They live forever. They burn nuclear fuel at such low rates that you can even go into trillions, uh, two or three trillion years for the lower mass ones. So they never become red giants or they never have a life. They just live, they're just a red dwarf all their life. That, that's nice if you want to live around one, it's stable. You don't have to worry about you know, the temperature, or the luminosity that you're gonna have will be constant through trillions of years. But uh, they have uh, also some things that aren't so great. So they have long lifetimes. Uh, half the red dwarfs in our neighborhood, and there are 240 of them within 30 light years of the sun, half of them are older than the sun by, by space motions and things like that. So it's an interesting star if they can have it, if they have planets, these planets, if they have life, could be more advanced life than us, if the big word is if. Um, for the people in the room who do solar work, they are noted for having deep convective zones. So their dynamos would be presumably different than our suns. And fully convective starts around M4. They fully convect all the way down to the core. So in these type, you're supposed to have a turbulent dynamo supposed to cut in rather than the kind of dynamo the sun has. But that is not going to be the case. These stars behave the same as the sun. The interesting thing is that 75% of all stars in the galaxy, uh, one-fifth of them from the Kepler mission, of, uh, are supposed to have planets in a habitable zone. So that means you're going to have 35 to 40 habitable zone planets within 10 light years of the sun. So far, uh, only five have been detected, but the rest are probably there that haven't been found yet. So that's an interesting thing for like SETI, for interstellar travel. You know, these are nearby stars. And a lot of them are older than the sun. And then this just does how many, there are lots of objects cataloged, 140 million spectra of red dwarfs. Some of my students did that work. These, how they look, the sun. This is a, 
the earliest type, 0, M5, DM8. So this is the smallest. When you go beyond this, you get into brown dwarfs and things like that. And these are their, uh, their properties down here. What's going to be important for habitability is this pr bottom property, is that they're faint. Uh, that means to have liquid water, to have it warm enough for liquid water in life, you have to be near th these stars. This is for the dynamo people. Again, this is the sun, and this is the size, relative size. This is now scaled up. So this is indicating, like for Proxima Centauri, theoretically it should have a dynamo all the way down to the core of the star. So this, and, uh, this is going to be a problem. We see no changes. Nothing shows up unusual when you cross from M3 to M5. Yes, maybe something does show up. Yeah. Yes. We don't see anything in terms of rotation or things like that. Or they all fit into these uh, diagrams of X-ray luminosity versus age or rotation. There's no bump there. But yes, you could have that. Yeah. It's supposed to happen. I just don't see. I'll give you the examples coming up. This is Proxima Centauri. Uh, is solar-like in all of its activities. Uh, so this is the breakdown. There's 240 now, uh, a big advance over the last 10 years. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the plot of uh, luminosity <clears throat> uh, relative to the sun. So the sun's here. Uh, so this shows an F star, very short main sequence lifetime. This is the sun, and it goes up to be a red giant. This is a K star. From here to here, from 20 billion years, it changes. It increases by... Uh, one percent in brightness. These nothing, one half percent from birth to death. Well, after it becomes the main sequence star, Zams. So this is why these things can last a very long time. The nuclear reactions go very slow. So this is kind of good, the long, stable lifetime. But you're living around the dim star. These are the so-called habitable zones. I guess most people are familiar with that. That's the distance you have to be away from the star. So you can have liquid water. And there's a lot of, you know, it depends on the star, it depends on the planet. Uh, in our solar system, the habitable zone goes from about uh, 0.9 AU to about 2 AU, yet Mars is a frozen planet. Well, if you gave Mars a little bit more atmosphere, so if you switch Mars and Venus, for example, they'd both be habitable. So it depends on albedos, and not just the star. So this is a setup for a solar star. So here's ours, out to 2. Into, if you want to be very, very generous, you could be 0.8. And uh, this is where this is called the Earth equivalent position. K stars, these are stars that are uh, called orange dwarfs. They're, they're not as luminous as the sun. So they have inner and outer uh, habitable zones of, of the order of uh, 1, A, 1 AU uh, is the equivalent position, out to about half AU. And the M dwarfs, these are all drawn to scale. So when you get to M dwarfs, your habitable zone is you know, a tenth of an AU. So you're sitting right on top of the star. Uh, to be warm. That's going to cause problems. That's going to make life difficult for life because you're sitting very close to a star. You're staying warm, but that very star is emitting as much x-rays and UV emission as the sun is, but you're in very close to it, and it will make the uh, radiation hazards around that planet pretty high. Uh, that's, your, that's just these numbers, the number that you want. 25%, this is from Ke Kepler and from Red Dwarf, so this is the these results are done by several people. They come in the range of 15 to 25 percent when you do the stats. So this is I told you what the program is. It's a copy of the of the solar program. Focuses on magnetic dynamos. In addition to these are all the different things that you get for solar stars. So this is all this dynamo stuff is up here. Um, rotation age is important. M stars can't be dated. So are red stars because they don't change their luminosity, radius, so you can't put them in evolution tracks because that doesn't happen. Uh, so, but they do spin down with time. And so you can use spin rate or rotation versus age if you can calibrate it. And then down here, this is where the stuff is used for planets. So we're getting into uh, enough irradiation measures that we can now use this data to irradiate a star around a red, a red dwarf, red, radiated planet around a red dwarf. Why? This is the observational data. Unfortunately, EUV, 
things, satellites like that, are no longer available, so you have to use archival data if you want to go out into extreme ultraviolet or even the FUV region. So we use a lot of, uh, these are still viable. So we get x-rays from Chandra, and XMM. Um, so these are the missions that we use, or archival data. Why x-rays? Most people know why. And the UVs, because they dissociate or ionize, cause photochemical reactions to take place, which are too numerous to deal with. Trouble with M stars, it wasn't so hard with, G, with solar stars, is their ages. So it's like this kind of thing at a carnival where you guess ages because the luminosity, radii, and temperature is almost changeless. So this was the major emphasis of our work in the last four or five years was to get M stars, red stars that had ages. This is how it was done. A membership in star clusters, the usual way. Uh, Pleiades, 100 million, Hyades, 650. So we did this as much as you could get. Uh, memberships and moving groups to go a little bit uh, older, uh, out to 2 billion years or so, if you belong to that cluster. Then this is where we spent most of our energies, right in here. Memberships and wide binaries. So this is how, uh, this is where we spent our time. And it's for example, if you believe Proxima Centauri is a member of the Alpha Centauri system, there's a 90% chance that it is, there's a 10% chance it was captured, then you know its age. Uh, Alpha Centauri A has an age of about 5 billion. It's been narrowing down finally to a, reason, to a number that doesn't jump around. So therefore, you know how old Proxima is. So that gives you the anchor for old stars, except it's an M5 star, M6 star, which I don't like using. And then recently, um, 16 sig, Oh, this is uh, Trevis work, uh, this, the astro seismology of 16 sig A and B, which are two G, two stars, uh, revealed their ages, 6.8 or 6.9 billion years with a small error bar. No stars have that precision except the sun and their rotations. But in addition to that, there is 16 Cygni C. So we're using the work on 16 Cygni A and B, which have seismic ages to get the age of C. And that would be the oldest star in our sample with a real age. Uh, so 6.7 billion now, you said. So it's moved up a little bit. So this is nice. And the other ones that we spent most of the time on are DM stars in wide, in wide binaries containing white dwarfs. We get the age of the system, uh, age of the red dwarf from the white dwarf, which is not straightforward at all. An example of this is 40 Eridani. And then for the very, very old stars, High space motions is an indicator of old age, along with low metals. So they have to have both of these, otherwise we don't use them. And this gives us uh, old disk. Here you have precisions of 20, 30% in age. So this is a white dwarf system. This is how it's done. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time, because this is a whole. You have a DA white dwarf um, with a companion. And you have to go through, no, you have to go through the evolution. It, it uh, evolved. Uh, became a blue off planetary nebula, and then what you end up with is uh, is the white dwarf itself. So you have to go back and find its initial mass, and you can find its. So what this involves very, a lot of the work is in is getting log g, getting the log, getting the mass of the white dwarf and its temperature. I'll give you an example, a white dwarf like the sun, like a star, like one solar mass, will end up with a white dwarf of uh, a mass of 0.5. Two solar masses, 0.6 masses. That's not a big you know, range there. So you have to be very, very careful in, in getting this together right to get the age. There's cooling times, which are not a big deal for old stars. And then there's the time that is spent on the main sequence, which is a big deal. And that depends on a lot of things. These are, the, these are light curves showing spots on some of these stars. Just to give an example, we have 125 of these nearby red dwarfs that have rotations and they have their spot coverages. So that's where we get our rotation. And where we get our age is from some of these are members of wide binaries. They're wide binaries because we don't want them to interact. This is one I brought up. I added this slide because there's an interest in Proxima Centauri. So this is Proxima Centauri. This is its light curve in V band. Pretty big variation. It's 5%. Five, 5 so it's pretty heavily spotted for an old star, 83 days. And it has a possible cycle. So this is a 7.6 7 
year. We have one more year here. It's up here someplace. I hope this holds up. But So this is an example of uh, a fully convective star, M5, fully convective, where it's behaving and it has differential rotation. In addition, when we do the spot models, it has differential rotation. So it behaves in a lot of ways like the solar stars do. I don't know why. Uh, so that's, this is V-band, you said? Yes, it's V-band. And how much is that? 5%. It's a easy, easy to measure. Well, I picked the best year. Uh, the spots smear around, and you can go down to nothing because you have spots all over the star. So this was a year in which there was a big spot or a spot group on one side. So I picked the, you know, as you do and when you show things like this, you show your best stuff. So we have, we have eight of these, and we can go... You know, the period changes from 83.2 to 83.7, which might be differential rotation. And when you model the spots, uh, we have to use differential rotation because the spots line up. Sometimes you get a big, this is the two spots are now together. In other years, you'll get a double curve. I put that in for you, just to, over lunch. <laughs> so. Okay, what's the um, instrumentation you use for this? Uh, we're using ASIS and we're using PROMPT. We got time on the prompt telescope. So these are small telescopes. Small telescopes. Yes. Yeah. They're point. Yeah, they're point five meters. Something. What kind of uh, absolute uh, precision can you get down to in say three? Oh, one percent. They're not great. We have. Bigger than the amplitude of the solar. Yes. Space. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're small telescopes. We don't get a lot of time on them. It's free time and uh, we take it we call the prompt telescope the rich man telescope because it's a rich guy <laughs> now this is when you get into this is harder now this is a captine star this is a photometry that we carried out that we barely see a rotation period there uh, we get 83 days it's a three sigma but then we went into the data sets and find harps they measure they've been sitting on Captain star, because it's one of the oldest stars. It has really high space motions. And uh, so when we went through that data set and used uh, calcium, we got a nice period here, which agrees with this period, 83.7 days, the same. So this, the people who published the paper were not aware of this. Of course, it looks like there may have been a flare. But I, I, who knows what's happened there. But we left that data in when we did the analysis. So that's one of our weakest ones uh, that was also done that was done with our prompt uh, data again this star is 11 billion years old and it is the oldest star that we have our uh, a rotation for sorry you can still get h and k emission from an mTOR yeah do you see any lines other than lime and alpha in the far uv oh you're getting to the next yeah next yeah if there's a reason he's asking that question is because oh it was on the slide Oh yeah, I'll, 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 co I'll come to that. Uh, one he's talking about, one of the advantages of this star, it's high space motion moves the Lyman alpha feature one angstrom away from uh, the geocoronal and also the worst, the ISM, which kills, smothers the line. So oh, let me go a little faster then. Uh, so this is the plot now uh, you saw. This is rotation versus age. And these split out, are beginning to split out, I think. These are the M2 to M5 stars, follow kind of this track. We have Barnard, these are uh, old disk stars, and we have Captain, another halo star down in here. They think this is real, but we need stars in here, which was what we're trying to do, trying to get stars. We are, we are observing stars. These are very difficult stars, because it takes five years to pull out a rotation period, because they're only half percent. They're feeble, uh, no, they're not spotted all that heavily. So we think that this was scatter until we then began to think, well, these M1 stars look like they're here, and these M5 stars look up here. So that's, uh, we're concentrating on stars right in here. Uh, this is just for comparison, if you want to see, this is the, this is the six billion years. Uh, Pro Proxima's age is now five, so it moves over here. So these are the Erebars. These are all white dwarfs. So these are, the ages here are from white dwarf, red dwarf pairs. Notice they're pretty big error bars because we can't get the age all that well from the white dwarf. There's too many assumptions. But this is K stars. 
And these are G stars. I didn't fill them in. And you can't go out much beyond 6 for Gs. You could go out to 6.8, but I mean, because they evolve off. So this is the spin down uh, with M stars, with K stars, with G stars. If you put A stars on, on here, they would just go across. You know, they, won't, they don't spin down. So a question. So for a given age, they tend to be rotating more slowly than solar wing stars? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can do that. You can even figure it out. The, the best example for this is Proxima is the Alpha Centauri system. The G2 star, 21 days. The K star, 37 days. Proxima, uh, I'm on the wrong, <laughs> Proxima Centauri, 83 days. But so you, you said they have uh, as much X-ray flux and UV flux? Yes, similar to the suns. So, so even, it's not a rotation effect, it's... Well, it's a rotation effect, but uh, it's probably because of the deeper convective zone, they're more efficient at producing uh, coronal emission. It's not because they're spinning faster. No, it's, it's no. These are spinning slow, but yet they're active. If you spun the sun down to, you know, had it go at 40 days, it, it wouldn't, you wouldn't even measure it. You wouldn't have any spots, probably. Yeah, it's because they have a different, a more efficient dynamo, is what people say. Um, a deeper convective core, so maybe that's the reason. There, to give you an example, the LX, the coronal emission to bolometric emission of the sun is like 10 to the minus 6. To an M star, it's 10 to the minus 3. So a thousand times more x-rays per nuclear. So they're, they're putting it out in terms of x-ray, uh, 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 in terms of their dynamo energies. And so this is one of the troubles is is going to come is that you have to live close to an M star, a uh, red, red dwarf star. This is going to present problems uh, because of strong X-ray and UV radiation. Just like I said, these guys are one thousandth the luminosity of the sun, but their X-rays are about the same as the sun. So when you move in that close to be warm, you're going to be X-rayed. You know, you're going to have a lot of ultraviolet radiation, especially when they're young. But even when they're old, this is just showing you a comparison of the three types, G, a K, and uh, these are all young, and M, M star. They have comparable amounts of uh, UV, FUV emission lines and strengths, but then the game changes here is that these are basically dead in the NUV until you get into the photosphere. So this is the photosphere of the star cutting in. Um, that's another whole other game. And this showing again the coronal emission. Okay, so this is now one example. We have UV emission, we have all the stuff, but this is just one example. So this is age again. Ages in here are well determined as best we could do. These Erebars, this is a bunch of old disk halo stars which have could go anywhere from seven to twelve. Captain star we know the age of pretty well because it, it may have been a member of an omega, omega centauri um, globular cluster that was tossed out. So we knew the age of that globular cluster. And so this is the rundown. Uh, and this one is, is to be measured. I mean, this is waiting to be measured. So this is the upper limit. Be nice because the age again of 16 C, A, and B are known. It's going to place it right here. And we have eight others that are in this area uh, waiting, well, for x-ray. There's a proposal in to get x-ray data. Maybe Jeff has one in, too. <laughs> <laughs> or he will. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is Jeff's work. This is Lyman Alpha. Uh, is it Jeff's work except for that star. So this is a, the Lyman Alpha is the most important line in the FUV. And so this is a plot of, of magnesium-2 and Lyman Alpha. Lyman Alpha is really hard to measure because it's a, absorption gets it. So if you can have another marker, which is magnesium-2, very accessible, then you can estimate its uh, flux. Very important for stellar, uh, for planetary atmospheres, the Nova Lyman Alpha. This is our study where we got ages for some of these stars, and there's Captain star out in, out in here. Notice there's not many stars. And this is Proxima Centauri, but if you make, it's a small star, if you scale it up and give it the same radius as these guys, then it fits into this figure better. Proxima doesn't belong in this plot, it's an M5 star, M6. These are all M2 stars. So if you scale up the radii, you get, this is from Jeff's paper. So this is the, e, the missing area that you can't get anymore. Uh, you can still get x-ray, but this is gone, no more satellites. 
uh, it shows you what's sitting out in the extreme ultraviolet. So you'd like, like to know what's there. And Jeff did a study of the ratio of Lyman alpha, Lyman series to Lyman alpha, there's the sun. So you can kind of get an estimate of the missing uh, EUV, FUV uh, radiation from Lyman alpha and from whatever else is in that area. The good news is that Lyman alpha contributes 80 to 90% of the total flux. So you can live without knowing what those lines are. Example, Captain star, there's all of its properties. Notice this number here, 245 kilometers per second. It's the second fastest star in the sky, proper motion and speed, because it's a population two star, the nearest one, relatively nearby. Um, this is its age, if you think it's a member of Omega Centauri. It has similar motions, but not identical motions. Um, it's, it may have been kicked out of that uh, cluster a long time ago. It has a retrograde galactic orbit. It indicates that maybe Alpha uh, Omega Centauri was captured. Maybe it was a spherical galaxy or something. So, but it, it, it didn't get notoriety except for its speed until this happened. And this is when we were awarded time, <laughs> when it was, two planets were discovered. Old stars aren't supposed to have planets because they have low metallicity. This metallicity is one-tenth the sun. So you're not supposed to have planets around that, or at least sil planets with silicates and iron. But it has two planets, apparently, from radio velocity motions. And one of them is in the habitable zone. So this became hot. So then we're getting ready. To, we have this paper almost ready to go as a, pu a publication. So these are the evidences uh, from this paper of planet one and planet two. Planet B is uh, super Earth. Uh, and this is about the radiation level you get on Mars, uh, 40%. So that's the uh, solar, not solar, stellar uh, irradiance, and this is the Earth. So it's about what you would get on Mars. If, but if you have an atmosphere there, you're OK. The habitable zone for this planet's here, for the stars here. That's the comparison they usually show. It took, took me a long time to get that image. <laughs> Here's a, an example of the, an old star and a young star. So the young star took GJ176. It's 2 billion years old. The age is known. It's in a moving group. And it is the blue line. Uh, oxygen 1 is geocoronal, so forget that. That's contamination. So here is uh, Captain star's emission, uh, 150th, 100th. Uh, so it really changes over time uh, by huge amounts. So Captain Star was like that at one time when it was younger. I'll go over these. This is the, this is why we got time on Captain Star. We used the high radial velocity motion. This is let's go back. So Lyman Alpha is the most important line that you have in the FUV spectrum. It is an important line to the ionosphere of the Earth planets because it, it is the major ionizer. And <coughs> So that's why Jeff and other people have been doing this, start, doing this work for years. This is what you typically get when you go to IUE. You get this is the spectrum down here. This is the reconstructed spectrum. All the things in here are the ISM and things like that that you have to correct for. And in this, in this, in this area, there's also the, 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 uh, the evidence, the, the production of the solar wind. So I just want to show you there's a lot of reconstruction going on here. And this is not. This is not a noisy one. They're much more noisier than this. This is where Captain Star is. So this is the geocoronal. We use COS because we could. Got time with COS. And we could, we could pull this stellar line out very easily. So what we did here is we just reflected it around the point back. So we wouldn't have any. Maybe there's a little bit of absorption in there from H1. So we have four others like this. We have like a list of 15 that have high velocities. So that's what Jeff was referring to. And these stars are neat because this is the most important feature, yet you have to go through all this work. And not work, it's, 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 you know, you're getting like 20 to 30% precisions when you're doing all this to pull that out. It's a lot of work, and it's been good work. They've been getting the, uh, Brian's been getting the, uh, the, the mass, mass losses. This is to give you a perspective of, um, a blow up where these the Lyman's are off the scale. They're up there, like five feet up. Uh, this is what you did. They do have lines. They're not dead stars 
they do have silicon four and things like that. They're, this is when you scale it to Lyman alpha star. This is a uh, geochronal feature. So you see why it's important. It's all you need is that line. When I first worked with the Austrian group, I meticulously went and measured every damn line there was and integrated it and all that and gave them energies for everything. What they did is that they summed it up and just called it EUV flux. <laughs> and I, 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 I was crying because I spent, I spent months getting these flux data. All they cared about was the total. And this guy in, in this star is 90% of the total flux all the way out to x-ray is from that line. A little bit from the Lyman series when you want to throw that correction in. So that's why it's so important. And this is what we're constructing for all the stars. That's x-ray. That's the FUV with Lyman alpha. Uh, that's the uh, near UV with IUE, a little piece of IUE there, and the HST. And then we decided to do the whole thing and go out into the uh, IR. So we're constructing tables like this for all the stars. We only have two stars done, this star and another. And this, taking it through time, this is the oldest one, will give you a radiance of this star and other stars over time. This is the sad part of the story, though. This is why I'm not so pessimistic about life uh, around M stars. Uh, this is a this is Captain Star, oldest star in the sample, basically dead. And this is the X-ray emission at the habitable zone. It's 20 times that the Earth gets from the Sun. It's mainly because you're getting a factor of its habitable zone is 0.15. When you take the square root, when you take the inverse square law, it makes it 44 times stronger. So even though this, is comp this has x-ray emission comparable to the sun, you're just right up against the star, getting 44 times more. So 20 times, this is today, 20 times more, two times Lyman alpha, then these things are about the same. These, this has to be the same, because you wouldn't be in the habitable zone. That's why 0.8 to 1 is in there. And this is where the star was young. If you want to take a young M star that has this guy, you're dealing with x-ray fluxes of 15, this is quiescent x-ray fluxes, of 1,000 to 2,000, 3,000 times higher. This is steady. Uh, FUV, Lyman alpha, 30 to 40 times. These, again, are about the same because these are mainly due to continuum, and there aren't many lines in there, and the, uh, the IR doesn't change. So this is where you start to worry about habitability is that this uh, planets that planet around Captain star had to endure billions of years of this kind of energies and God knows what kind of winds and how many flares we don't, do know how many flares and CME events I mean it's lucky to be there <laughs> even as uh, super earth maybe it moved in you know maybe there's ways of explaining it maybe it was a Neptune that got whittled down to the size of a super earth uh, but this is not good news in terms of M stars or red dwarfs as habitable uh, star, suitable for habitable planets. And then you have just I'll go have flares, giant flares, the things, the bad things they do to your DNA if you can get that far. Uh, this is another paper. This is uh, Sir Gore. She has a study of uh, what flares do to the atmospheres of stars, uh, which I don't have time to talk about. This is our study flare rates. So the sun, solar stars calm down rather fast. And about the sample that we have of flaring at about a half billion years, they're, they're OK. I mean, you get, uh, you get flares, but you get them once a month, something like that. These guys are even at 2 billion. Th these ages are coming from rotation. So the rotation and age are related. So that's why I have 2 billion up there and 1 billion. I'm getting that from the rotation period. Notice the flares. You're like 45% of the time. 50% of the time, they're still going at it. And uh, so number of flaring objects per number of uh, objects. And all the young ones, that's why red dwarfs are called flare stars, because the, all the very young ones flare all the time, have you, like AD Leo and so on. But this is not good news. And we can't go on beyond, this is from Kepler, we can't go on beyond this because we lose, Kepler has a 90 day period before it rotates and you can't get the rotations so clearly uh, to see what the older ones are doing. And then I'll apply it to a few systems. What we do here is, uh, just this is near the end, fortunately. So this is, uh, we get ages. 
for, uh, by applying what's called the rotation age relationship. Now we have to specify, is it an M2, an M3? We just can't say M anymore because the M, M1 stars spin down slower than the M5 stars do, so now we put that in. And it can give you the age of planetary systems, like Kepler-186. We had a rotation, and these are published. People publish this rotation because they're actually observing a transit eclipse. So part of the game and the paper, embedded in the paper, will be we find a 33-year signal, and a 30-day signal uh, is due to the rotation. So we just put that into our program and chart out an age. And that you know, has an arrow on it that's pretty big. You know, you're looking like 40%. But it's better than the literature in their paper. They give an age from 1 billion to 10 billion. I think that's pretty safe. They are going to be in there, 1 billion to 10 billion. I also saw a paper that gave 1 billion to 20 billion. And I thought that was pretty neat, that that thing was back before the Big Bang. <laughs> so you find stuff like that in the literature. In other cases, this star is a famous star. This is HD 189. For people who do stars, this was one of the uh, hot Jupiter's first transiting planets. It has a very short orbit, like three to two days. So orbit's very, very close. It's almost like drawn here. And the host star is rotating very quickly. And it looks like it's a very young system. And this star is interacting with this guy. It has a field. It's in the corona of the star. But when we went through, we found that it had an M star companion that was rotating very slow was a low X-ray emitter, and we pinned its age to about that. So what it's turning out to be is that this star is being spun up by the planet. That's why the case of the tail, tail wagging the dog. So that, that Jupiter planet, size planet, it's bigger than, five times bigger than Jupiter. It is interacting with this star. Its, its orbit is decaying. This star is spinning up, and you have then the scenario. There's the M dwarf. And you have the scenario. This is a model of it. This is the star, this is the corona, there's the planet. So it's inside the star, uh, interacting. They have x-rays, uh, stuff going on that people found. And the final fate, I can decide to see how long the star had, had to live. And I went down, I was very surprised that it would have a six hour period before it would reach its Roche lobe. It would be gone by that time due to uh, 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 evaporation that's taking place. Final one is this uh, famous, this is the nearest Probably if you had to go to a planet these days, if you had an interstellar mission, the Earth was going to be hit by a microscopic black hole or zombies took over the Earth, and you could get there. The, the best case in, for a planet, super, a planet that would be habitable, is this Gliese 581, but it's pretty far away, 21 light years. And uh, the star, the planet G, is no longer with us. And this is, the, this is the system. It's around an M star. This is the solar system. So uh, we were able to get the age of that star, because you don't want to go to a, a planet that's just, you know, the first half billion years of its life, you'll be bombarded by asteroids, and the star will be spewing out x-rays. So this star is nice and old. It's 7 billion years old, reasonable age that even could have life, even you know, intelligent life. These are all the age discriminators. But these are all blown away by the fact that after six years of observing it, we ended up with a 116-day period that we believe. So these are all the diagnostics of uh, getting age, calcium, alignment of x-ray emission, space motions. Rotation's the best. So the planet around there, and this is where the end is, the planet around there is uh, because we were talking about this at lunch, is syn synchronized. So this is the planet I chose was uh, the one that's in close, the hotter one, which is real. And so it has a, uh, let's see, it's an M3 star. So its orbital period is 13, and its rotation period should be 13. So it should be locked. And that's, that's the real distance. We first started doing this. We never got time to do, do we never got time to do planets. Uh, to, Twelve years ago, we had a proposal in to do planets around red dwarfs. And the review came back, there's no planets around red dwarfs. They don't have big enough disk. That was good news. Then the second time we tried it, if you do have a planets were found, is that this synchronization would cause this to happen. Is that if it had an atmosphere, it would all sublimate out on the side, being cold. This side would be a desert. Well, that was shown to be false, and more studies have been made that show this cartoon lie going on, that there would be circulation 
uh, from the hot side to the cool side. This would be like the equator of the Earth. This would be the North Pole. We have similar, except these are much more complex. This is a cartoon. Yeah. This is uh, shown to be forced to be using the uh, GCM model. Uh, which one? This, you said this is. Uh, this picture is shown this, to be false because these, it's a GCM model. Yes, okay. but this is. There's better ones. There's meteorology of this planet. I'm just not showing you the Coriolis effect and the wind systems and all that. Just go into the internet and search this person, this planet, and you'll find seven studies. So this has meteorology studies. Uh, this is a, a cartoon because I didn't want to show all the circulations going on. But what the bottom line is is that it makes the backs. Well, I guess I took it out. Yeah, I had to take something out. It makes the backside of the planet actually not so bad to live on. So this is a more recent study from astrobiology where if I had an ocean, this is the substellar point. The star is pointing at this. So it would have all ice, except this part here where the star is right above it would be water. This is for a non this is one that's non-rotating. And what happens when you have circulation in the oceans, it carries the warm water around to the back. This is the back of the planet here. And this is the substellar point again. This is the temperature of the air. And this is what happens when you have it carried around. And so these are the kind of work that's, I have nothing to do with this work, but this is the kind of work that's being done. It's kind of neat that's happening in this field. And what's needed? Improve measures of stellar winds. Jeff would like that. <laughs> and uh, improved ages. That's nice. Finer calibration of age rotation. We didn't know how dependent it was on the mass and spectral type when we began the study. Nor did we have many choices. There weren't that many stars. Better flare information, really important. Uh, flare rates, spectral type, and age. And then this one is the one that is not in our field, but it's what planets. You need a magnetic field, bottom line. There's not a lot known about geomagnetic uh, magnetic fields uh, terrest for terrestrial planets, especially for super-Earths. Some people say they're going to be stronger because it has a big core. Other people say because of the heavy gravity, there's not as much convection, not circulation, so the magnetic field will be weaker. Really important to figure that out, and people are working on that because it's so important for the survival of the planet's atmosphere and for possible life. Another neat thing to look at is maybe to look for auroral features in some of the planets, although they're pretty far down. I thought they were about 100, one-tenth below what could be detected. I'm not going to do the, this. Let's skip all this. This is the bottom line here almost. Um, Ebb stars don't make very good hosts for life-bearing planets, in my opinion. Um, it's because of the flares have to live so close to it. The flare activity, the ultraviolet, is really going to put a lot of stress on whether you could support life, have a planet that would evolve, have an atmosphere left after four or five billion years that could have uh, life on it. The best stars in the game seem to be the, the K stars, the orange dwarfs, which are pretty numerous, 10% of stars of this type. We haven't ruled it out, just saying that there's not going to be as many suitable red dwarf stars that will have life-bearing planets because a lot of them, a lot of those planets are going to be destroyed in the early days of the star's life. Some will make it probably and some might have life. Still, there are 100 billion of them. So even if a small fraction make it, uh, that would be good. K stars have the advantages of both. Long lifetimes, 20, 30 billion years. You don't have to be as far away. You don't have to be as near. 1 AU, you're perfectly fine at 1 AU. Uh, half, 1.5 to 1.5 AU is their habitable zone. So you're far enough away that you don't get zapped all the time from the X-rays and uh, ultraviolet. They are more, they are less active than red stars, less, less active than G stars. Yeah, more active than G stars, less active than M stars. And we're working on this right now, trying to get uh, rotations and doing the same thing we did for the red red dwarfs. And then you have this last cartoon. Goldilocks, after choosing orange dwarf stars as the best choice for supporting planets suitable for long, is confronted by three bears. I don't know what they're going to do to her. I hate it's funny. <laughs> so that's the end. So it's all going to phase out. Thank you. I'm sorry for the technical problems. <laughs>